the Honorable Sir Ian Winder, Chief Justice, Sir Michael Barnett, President of the Court of Appeal, and Lady Barnett, Sir Burton Hall, and Lady Hall, Sir Brian Marie Casey, Senator the Honorable L. Ryan Pinder Casey, Attorney General, members of the Cabinet, Justices of the Court of Appeal and of the Supreme Court, Judges of the Industrial Tribunal, Magistrates, and other judicial officers, Senators and members of the House of Assembly, retired Justices, Mr. Khalil Parker Casey, President of the Bahamas Bar Association and member of the Council of Legal Education, Colleagues at the bar, ladies and gentlemen, students, alumni, and staff of the Eugene DePuch Law School, good evening. It is my great honor to welcome you to the Eugene DePuch Distinguished Lecture, a mainstay for the Eugene DePuch Law School, and one which this year holds particular significance as we celebrate our 25th anniversary. On this Silver Jubilee occasion, we take a moment to celebrate a quarter century of accomplishments, to reflect on the journey behind us, the privilege that we have enjoyed in playing a supportive role in the advancement and progress within the field of law and legal education in our region. And we look forward with anticipation to the future that lies ahead. This is also a moment for EDLS to acknowledge the extraordinary contributions to our achievements made by so many of you who are here with us this evening, particularly our alumni, in whom we take immeasurable pride in their display of our commitment to fostering leaders and professionals dedicated to serving our community. Tonight, we are privileged to host an unparalleled luminary panel of presenters, featuring the current Chief Justice, Sir Ian, formerly a Justice of Appeal in the Turks and Caicos Islands, Sir Michael, President of the Court of Appeal and former Chief Justice, Sir Burton, former Justice of Appeal and Chief Justice, and Sir Brian, former Chief Justice, and also formerly a Justice of Appeal. In the time allotted to us this evening, we could not hope to effectively recount the extensive curricula vitae of these distinguished gentlemen. But what I must say is that each of them has given unstinting support to the law school through their service on the Council of Legal Education and for three of our panelists as members of our very own faculty. This has been instrumental in EDLS's growth and success. The generosity of our panelists in sharing their wisdom over the 25 years through past presentations and other engagements has left an indelible mark on our school enriching our curricula and inspiring our students and faculty alike. This year, this distinguished lecture breaks from the tr our tradition by presenting in a fireside chat format, promising a more intimate and engaging dialogue. Moderating this evening's conversation is renowned veteran journalist, Mr. Jerome Sawyer, whose expertise and insight will undoubtedly elevate our discourse. I am hopeful that the conversation this evening will inspire us, that it will provoke thoughtful discussion, and will continue the tradition of excellence that has defined the Eugene DePuch Law School for the past 25 years. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you very much. Madam Principal, thank you, for, thank you so much for setting the occasion this evening and for that very kind introduction. Uh, whenever people call me a veteran, I, 
I pause because I never think I'm old enough. And then I look in the mirror and see the greys. But ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the Eugene Depute Distinguished Lecture 2024. I am your host as introduced, Jerome Sawyer. Over the next 90 minutes, uh, on the occasion of its 25th anniversary, the Eugene Depute Law School will present Justices in Dialogue. This is an historic occasion for so many reasons. Uh, the presence alone of so many uh, distinguished uh, persons in the audience really speaks to the occasion, but I think beyond that, to have such distinguished talent, I call them, on the stage in one place at one time, really speaks to, I think, the work of the law school and the respect that you have earned, and those of you who have come through the organization know of, wit of what I speak. Now, you will hear from some of the most respected and knowledgeable legal experts in the country, some of the more distinguished chief justices past and present. And as they have already been formally introduced, I will just quickly introduce them on stage as they are here, and then we will move directly into our discussion. The Honorable Sir Ian Winder, who is our Chief Justice, the Honorable Sir Michael Barnett, President of the Court of Appeal of the Bahamas and a former Chief Justice, as well as Sir Burton Hall, a former Chief Justice, and the Honorable Sir Brian Murray, again, a former Chief Justice. Our intention tonight is to present a series of topics and hear opinions from our distinguished panels. Gentlemen, as we have had an opportunity to speak prior to this, I won't go over the rules of engagement, but just, I won't go over those rules again, but just merely to dive right in. So we begin now with uh, the topic on judicial decision making. And my question to you is, can judicial decisions be seen as a form of activism? If so, how do you define the line between judicial activism and judicial restraint, particularly in cases where societal progress may require a reinterpretation of existing laws. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> you know, there's a saying that judges interpret the law and do not make the law. And <clears throat> it is always a challenge for us, uh, certainly for me, uh, in deciding cases to have regard to decisions that have been made by courts before and how to apply them to <clears throat> changing circumstances. And it's not always an easy task because we have this doctrine of stare decisis where we say that we're bound by precedent. But sometimes we want to push the envelope uh, a little further. And sometimes we don't know whether or not we should push the envelope in our judgments or whether or not we ought to leave it to Parliament to, to address some of the challenges in terms of moving the law forward. And, and it's, it's, it's a, not an easy task, and we don't always get it right, because uh, different judges look at things differently. Well, as Sir Michael has said, foundational is the principle that judges interpret the law, not make it. And indeed, this is not novel. It is not peculiar to us. In fact, there's a saying going all the way back to Roman law, jus dicere non jus dare. The judges say the law, they don't make it. And the um, <clears throat> reality of applying the law in the particular cases that come before it, because it is useful to remember, the judges do not initiate matters. Judges only decide matters which litigants choose to bring before the court. And as the former chief justice was want to say, the registry is always open, so persons can file any grievance that they think they have. And in terms of that balance to which Sir Michael alluded, I am reminded of, uh, of the statement in, uh, made by Archibald Cox, who some of you may be old enough to remember was the chief prosecutor arising out of the Watergate trials in the United States 40, well, I'm getting old, many years ago. 
And he made the observation that the answer to the question, what is the result according to law, is not always the same as what result is best for society. And he goes on to say that no court can wisely or permanently grasp either horn of that dilemma. If I may um, jump in with another, I guess, subsequent question. So what then influences a judge's approach to cases where the law's literal interpretation may lead to unjust outcomes? Right, before, before you leave activism, the general definition of activism, judicial activism, is the judge inputting his own views or his own thinking in a particular case. I don't think generally judges do that. I think uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a saying I think Robert McGarry is credited with, where he says, a judge's duty is to be obedient to his judicial oath and to his judicial conscience in observance of the law. He is supposed to do what he ought to do, not what he wants to do. I think in terms of activism, if, it's, if that's the thinking, which seems more a uh, generally an American thought, uh, I don't think activism is something that we generally, because as, as, as I said, we only hear the cases that come before us. And there may be views that you may have, but your oath requires you to deal with the case as the law requires you to deal with it. And, and, and Jerome, it is a fact that courts view things differently over the years, and uh, different judges look at things differently. And that's the dynamics of the law. In the topics that you sent us, one of the things you highlighted was the citizenship case uh, in which Chief Justice Winder came to a decision. <laughs> no, 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 I'm saying this, no, no. Chief Justice Winder came to a decision which was different from an earlier decision made by Sir Burton when it came to the Court of Appeal, three judges supported the decision of Chief Justice Winder in his interpretation of a provision of the Constitution. And two judges agreed with the earlier approach and decision of Sir Burton. And it was taken to the Privy Council and the Privy Council came down 5 nil <clears throat> in favor of the construction given by Sir, Sir, Sir Ian. It shows that it's the law hadn't changed in terms of the provisions in the Constitution, but the judges looked at it differently. And I think most, uh, certainly for me, most of us felt that the law ought to be the way it was eventually decided. But we were reluctant to do so because we weren't sure that as judges, we could push the envelope that far. So, and, and, and that is a classic example of the challenges that we sometimes face. But, but before, so, before, before Brian, uh, and, the decision ultimately was decided basically on the literal interpretation, not on any of the other questions of the, the other constitutional interpretation issues, but purely on the literal construction. So Brian, I need Yeah, I, I would just wish to make a, a slightly different point. Um, you know, it was Lord Bingham who resolutely said in one of the books, um, and the art of judging, that it is now the conventional view 
among international jurists that judges are lawmakers. Now, if you stop there, that might be a somewhat radical statement. But I think, as always, Lord Bingham was very astute in this observation. Uh, let's take the common law, for instance. The genius of common law is that it is evolutionary. And while judges at different levels are subject to stare decisis, as Sir Michael has said, there's no question that common law is, in effect, judge-made law. Um, so I, I, my view on it is that, that within certain limitations, judges do make law. The flexibility for doing so is greater under common law, subject to stare decisis and the certainty of law, which is another important principle. When it comes to statutory provisions, um, I think the flexibility is somewhat more circular. Um, but, but nevertheless, the case that Sir Ian and Sir Michael referred to, the citizenship case, is, is an example of when construing a particular statute, um, there, is, there is ample room to come to different views and based upon your view, you may take the law in a different direction. So my take on it is that there are two extremes on this question of judicial activism, neither of which are right. One extreme is the law is sterile and the judge is impotent and the courts are impotent and there can be no movement in the law unless it's done through legislation. I think most of us would agree that's clearly wrong. And on the other extreme, the courts are not to encroach into the area of the legislature or to seek to usurp the functions of the legislature or the executive. Uh, and so judges who engage in what is sometimes judicial legislation, I think they go a bridge too far. So as is often the case in life, neither extreme view in my view is right. I think the answer remains somewhere in the middle where you have balance and you have limitations. But I, I do think the reality is that the judges do make law. It's just that they are subject to certain conditions and certain principles. Um, and, and as I say, the, the genius of the common law is exactly that point because it allows the law to evolve in order to take care of circumstances <clears throat> as they develop in society. So I think one judge said, uh, if there was no, no common law, it would be like asking a man who is 56 years old to put on a suit or when he was 19. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't work and the law is sterile. So uh, I, I think that's my take on it. Sure. Um, and, and I think that judicial ad, you know, to activism is, depends on what you mean by it. Um, but as Ian says, I don't think it's, it's, it's open for a judge to impose his or her own values or their own views on a case. But clearly, there is room within the proper discharge of their judicial functions to develop the law within certain restraints. I want, though, to go back to something that I used in the opening question and how much of the decisions, and, and it's interesting that you brought up the issue of citizenship um, and how the decisions changed, but how much of it is societal progress versus pressure? Because there are many times when, um, and as a journalist, I, I know this, when the public is critical, um, and I, that's going to lead us into another <clears throat> discussion shortly, but when the public is critical of a situation or a piece of legislation or law, existing law, when does societal progress and pressure come into play? I mean, <laughs> judges don't live in ivory towers. I mean, I don't think anybody should suggest that. So they are aware of what's out there in the public. But I think, certainly for my part, I try to, to look at the law as it has been construed and interpreted in the past and apply it to the factual predicate that's before me and to do my best to make the right decision in respect of the facts before me, irrespective of public opinion, uh, in respect of pressure. You, 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 
you try to apply the law as you understand the law to be in the circumstances of the facts that are before you. Uh, I know where you're heading in terms of the controversial subject, and that probably is a good way. That's probably a, a good example of not succumbing to, to pressure. I, I think judges, and more so judges on the, in the criminal division, are always under pressure from the society as to uh, what their expectations are, whether bail or whether in terms of uh, the pace at which criminal trials uh, take place. Uh, but those judges have to discharge their functions as they see the justice of the situation determines. Uh, before we get to to really to the issue of uh, of bail um, and the role in society, <laughs> societal change, I do want to go back to a question that I did pose. So what influences the judge's approach to cases where the law's literal interpretation may lead to unjust outcomes? Look, look, I have a, I have a, I have a, a popular say. If you think your law leads to an unjust result. Go back and check your law. Because the law is not designed to come up with an unjust result. The law seeks fairness. The law seeks what is right. You may have different views about it, but the law is not designed to achieve an unfair result. And if at the end of the day, you think the result is unfair, is unjust, then go back and look at your law to see whether or not you have in fact interpreted the law or construed the law properly. Because as a general proposition, the law is not design to come up with an unfair or an unjust result. I, I can agree with Sir Michael in the sense that even the rules of interpretation allow you to waver away from uh, unjust or absurd results. So I think the judge in applying the law uh, could use the opportunity, if there are other alternatives, uh, to find that those alternatives are either more intended or would uh, Parliament intended to. But it, it needs to be said that there are times when a judge will come to a conclusion which is not where he or she would, if it was left entirely up to them, where they would be. But you are constrained sometimes to follow precedent, and then of course you are constrained always to follow a statute subject to the issue of interpretation. So I think sometimes judges can get around it in the name of interpreting the section. Um, clearly, they can't rewrite the section. And there are times when, in the context of a statute, it may produce an unfair result. And the ability of the judge to mitigate that, I, I think, really depends on to what extent, true to his oath, and true to not engaging in judicial legislation, he might be able to soften the blow or completely resolve it through a particular way of interpreting that statute or construing that statute. But let's not deny the fact that I think every judge at, at one time or another in his or her career probably came to a result that they would have preferred it was different. And, and that is because the days of measuring justice by the size of shoe of the chance is over. Um, and there are times when you are, you are boxed in. Um, very clever judges can sometimes find ways um, to, to, to mitigate the issue, as I said. But um, there are limits to that. I mean, judges cannot do what they want to do, right? There's a lot that you can do in the name of discretion, um, and there's a lot that you can do in the name of interpretation. But even they have their limits in certain cases. I want to move forward uh, to broaden the discussion a bit to the judiciary's role in so social change. And Sir Burton, I don't want you to think that I've forgotten you on the end there. And so I'm going to start with you, 
Uh, to what extent does the judiciary have a responsibility to contribute to social change? And I want to use the example uh, when you consider the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in overturning Roe versus Wade. Well, of course, I'm <coughs> not going to presume to pass on the um, this particular decisions of, of, of other countries. Uh, 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 but but I, what, I would address the general principle of this dilemma, and, and it really flows out of the earlier part of the discussion when you're talking about justice and whatnot. It is useful to bear in mind, it is something that judges continually have to remind people that the judicial oath is to do justice according to law. So that the when we get into this whole idea of justice and its um, um, connection with uh, the whole myriad of social and political um, problems that beset the society, it can be a very slippery slope for, um, for, for um, judges to be um, misled or forced by social pressure into arriving at just decisions. The safer course, uh, the correct course, is the, the, the matter of, 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 of um, justice according to recognized rules. The, it is a romantic notion in which a lot of people would wish to, uh, a lot of people would wish to embrace. The, the, the statement attributed to St. Augustine of Hippo that an unjust law is no law at all, lex in justia non est lex. But if you step back for a second, you recognize that if people were to embrace that, we'd have social anarchy. Because th th there's so many different views that, that, uh, that, uh, um, that, that royal society are not only our society, but generally in terms of what is the correct result. So that the, um, where there is um, uh, consensus by whatever means, and remember what I um, mentioned earlier about judges only concern being um, uh, limited to matters that come before them. They, don't, they are not, as Benjamin Cardozo said, knights errant going out um, um, finding just causes to fight. So the, the, um, that is time when it is catapulted into the political arena for those who make political decisions with political consequences. Um, one of my, the first cases in, with which I was saddled when I became a judge, we all grew up with stories of hearing about um, the elderly parent who was taken care of by the daughters in the house and then the wastrel son comes along and kicks the, kicks the daughters out. And that was wrong. This is before the law was changed. Back, I think it's 2000, when the law about primogeniture was changed in the Bahamas. But one of the very, I always thought those stories were, were, were apocryphal at best. But one of the very first cases that came before me was exactly such a case. And the way society has evolved, my sense of decency and what was right and what was just was that the son shouldn't have been able to do this. But the law at that time required me to hold that the son was, was perfectly legally entitled to, take, to, 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 to cast his sisters out of the house. So the, I cite that as an example of how the, um, whatever the personal views of judges um, might be, they should always remind themselves that they're judges, they aren't social engineers, and they aren't politicians. And one of the, um, um, speaking of judicial activism, I remember around the time of um, the case of Pratt and Morgan, and all of the lawyers, and particularly younger lawyers, will remember the knock-on consequences of that decision, which had the Privy Council decision having to do with the impermissibility of imposing the death penalty after a particular period of time. 
there was a case arising out of, I think it was the state of New York, involving a challenge to the allocation of public housing. And a judge found himself in the position of, um, I think reallocating is the, is the correct, which, which the, which the um, legislative body had done in terms of funding. Now, how many judges want to be saddled with that sort of thing? That may be a circumlocutious answer to your question, but. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just, just sure. a brief observation. When you're dealing with these social issues that come before the courts, um, I, I don't think the outcome should depend upon the ideology of the judge. Um, social issues often involve strongly held, passionate differences of opinions. And if, it, if you ever get to a point where a court is perceived as being ideologically hard right or hard left, <clears throat> this is a slippery slope. Um, and it is particularly dangerous with regard to social issues. Because when you deal with these social issues, your value systems, your ethics, your culture come into play. And frankly, the outcome should not depend upon which judge you're before. Um, and so I, I think judges are trained to, to, to have the discipline to suppress their own ideological views. And I, I once uh, heard of an, an English judge um, in an interview state that there were two times in his career, that twice in his career, when he ended up giving a decision which was absolutely dead against his own ideological view because he thought that's where the law was taking him. So, I mean, when you get into Roe and Wade, which of course is an electric subject in the US, um, <clears throat> you have to be very careful to maintain the impartiality and respect of the court by not allowing your ideology to affect your view of the law. Um, because at that point, justice then is seen um, as something which, if I can find a right-wing judge or if I can find a left-wing judge, um, you know, in the States, they have different circuits and certain, certain circuits are known as liberal and some are more, known, as more, known as more conservative. Th this is a dangerous state of affairs for a court system. And, and I think we have to be very careful um, not to be led into these social issues well, um, with, you know, with regard to our ideology, well, so Michael, me, our value let me, system. Let me push the envelope a different way. Sir Burton gave an example where he felt that by virtue of the statutory law, the son, was entitled to the to the succession to the real property. But the courts are in fact imaginative because that does seem to be a sort of doesn't accord with fairness. But suppose the daughters were contributing to the maintenance of the house, the improvement of the property, and daddy made certain representations to them as to what they could expect as a result of their efforts. But he made no will. No, but he made, but he made no will. But he made, no, exactly. But he made no, but he made no will. Exactly. They also have to argue that, though. Huh? They also have to argue that. Yeah, I know, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But the point I'm getting at is that there is law which will enable a judge to find a remedy that would give the sisters who invested into the house improved the property, looked after daddy on the representation that uh, daddy would ensure that they have, have uh, they get some interest in the house. And so the law 
does enable judges in certain circumstances to see whether or not in that factual predicate, notwithstanding the, the will and the Inheritance Act may have given this person the right to property, as to whether or not those sisters have some form of an equitable interest in that property. And that's an example, I think, in which uh, I say, sometimes when you think the law has come up with a result that's not right, that the law does allow you to look to see whether or not there is some law which will protect the interests of that daughters, of those daughters, who invested into the property, who improved the property, who looked after daddy on the expectation that daddy was going to give them an interest in the house. That, that, so so it's, it's not as cut and dry as to say simply because the Inheritance Act says something. The law does allow you to go look to see whether or not the law compels me to that result or whether or not there is another avenue which will enable the courts to give an interest in that property to the children. So that's, that's, that's what I mean when I say, when you think the law comes to an unjust result, and the law is not designed, in my view, to come up with an unjust result, check to see your law, whether the law compels you to come to that unjust result, or whether or not there's some law that exists which enables you to fashion a remedy which may give an interest to those children, to those sisters. That's, that's the only point that I want to make, that, you know, yes, we must, we must follow the law, but let us look to make sure we have the law right and that the law does not give rise to an, unjust, to, an unresolved, to an unjust result. Cian, would you like to chime in or can we move on? No, no, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> Your expression says otherwise. So no. <laughs> Insofar as we distinguish between our roles as judges and our roles as the advocate, in terms of uh, let the lawyers fashion their, their case to suit this result rather than, you know, uh, fashioning the results for them. That, that's the only uh, To that extent, uh, I'm probably an activist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think much people would disagree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, if, if I, if, you know, <laughs> I know some, some, some people take the view that if you got a bad lawyer and he didn't think of the argument, you're stuck. Maybe true, maybe right. <laughs> but sometimes you have to guide some people. <laughs> Here's your judicial activism. Please, please feel free. <laughs> Before we move forward. I, I, can, I can see that. I can All see right. that. So we're, we're going to advance uh, our discussion a bit. Gentlemen, thank you again. Uh, the point of a discussion is to, to be able to flesh these, these views out. So. I, I encourage you to continue, but uh, as we move forward now, looking at the judicial process, it brings us uh, to an issue um, that has really, in my opinion, pit the public against the judiciary in some ways, and uh, this is on the issue of bail and the right to bail. Um, the public uh, has been very vocal, and as a journalist, uh, I, I know uh, that on a, almost on a daily basis, at one point, we were inundated with requests uh, and questions as to why certain individuals were given the right to bail. And it seemed to be a disconnect between uh, what was being said and what the public was receiving. So I'm going to sort of just put the issue there for a moment and, and allow you all to, to chime in. Two of these gentlemen I've had the honor of putting this question to in the past, but since I've had those discussions, uh, there has been an amendment, and I want to uh, open the floor for discussion on this right to bail, um, and what continues to be a, a, a great area of concern for the public. And I say that because often, even as a young reporter, we get into court and we're not quite clear what we're listening to 
or trying to interpret. So I always say, imagine the public when we try to tell the story. Um, and so I, I'm going to get to, to bring it to that point. And because there are many who are in this room or watching uh, in the broadcast and still asking the question about this right to bail. And why is it that we seem to be giving criminals bail? And I'm going but, to leave it. But there. Mr. Stoyer, yes. let, let me interpose. Is the person a criminal? I, I, or is he charged with an offense? I, I am leading the discussion. And so as I say to as I say to many of my guests, I am simply here to ask the question. <laughs> and, and, and again, I think you started off on the right point. The moment someone is accused, I think in the, in the public side, yeah. uh, that person is almost guilty. And so let's start at that point, See, uh, I, the presumption I, of innocence. I, I think the outcry from the public, particularly in at times of very high crime, is understandable. Um, and I, I'm sure all judges uh, are aware of that. Judges live in the society like, like everybody else does. They don't live in some ivory tower, you know, we are in a vacuum. So, so the debate um, is certainly one which the judges are aware of. But here's the difference. Judges don't have the luxury of responding emotionally to this subject of bail. Because at its essence, it involves some of the most treasured fundamental rights of citizens, which are an integral part of our democracy and a rule of law. No one would really want to live in a society where merely because the police arrested you, you are deemed to be guilty and treated accordingly. If anybody would suggest that that, that is okay, let it happen to their son or their husband, or their daughter. And they would be the first to run to a lawyer to say, get my child out on bail, right? Because this is a false charge and he didn't do it. Now, whether it was or not is another matter. But all I'm saying is that <clears throat> the judges don't have the luxury of responding in that emotional way. Judges are the ultimate custodian of the constitutional rights of everybody in this country. And of course, at the, at the, at the foundation of bail, is the presumption of innocence. Now, this is not just a slogan. You know, it rolls off the lips quite easily. This is, this is an, an essential reality for a democratic society. So if you start off the debate by saying, why, and I'm not criticizing you because you, are, you did exactly what you wanted to do, and you wanted to tease the issue out. <laughs> so I don't direct this comment at you, <laughs> right, who we all know is, is one of our finest journalists. But if, if, if on the public square the, de the, the debate starts, why are judges letting these criminals out on bail? Right there, that's not going to go anywhere, that debate, right? Because the fact of the matter is this so-called criminal is entitled to a presumption of innocence, and the court must regard that person in that way. So the mere fact that you are arrested does not mean that you are to be treated as a convict. And there is the constitutional issues that have to be, that have to be concerned for the judge. And, and so there is, a, there is a far more disciplined and analyti analytical approach that has to be taken towards bail. Um, and, and I think if, if the debate is properly framed, the outcome will be more productive. But, but when, you, when the underlying predicate is, this person has already con committed a crime, and he belongs behind bars in order to protect the safety of the public. Right? If that was the view that the courts, courts took, we would be living in a fundamentally different country, right? which I don't think any of us would really like. So I only start off the discussion in that sense. Um, there is the presumption of innocence. Uh, the, the fact that you're arrested doesn't mean you're convicted of anything. Um, clearly, and let me say something perhaps even more controversial, <coughs> which would be unpopular in the public square. Even if an individual is charged with three or four offenses, the fact that he's being charged with three other offenses doesn't mean that when he comes before the court on the fourth offense, he is to be denied bail 
merely on the fact that he was charged in three other offenses, because the same premise applies. In all of those three instances, he's not being convicted of anything. So you have to look at the evidence, of course, and you see how strong it is. Um, but I, I think the key to, to having a productive debate on this is to start at the beginning and, and just to realize that we can't be locking up everybody um, just because they're charged, even though there may be an inclination to do that to want to, in, yes. in the public square. I think you've heard my voice enough on this in the last. <laughs> so I, I, I will leave it to the. Hmm. But, but the thing about this bail issue is every one of these gentlemen at some point, at some opening of the legal year, had to make some address because it's a recurring, recurring issue. Because there are waves and there are ebbs and flows in terms of the current situation. Uh, but the circumstances haven't changed significantly uh, in terms of the grant or refusal of bail. One of my frustrations is reporting. <laughs> Under the law, if a judge grants bail, he has to put in writing the reasons for which he granted bail. And I see a lot of people complaining without bothering to look at the judge's judgment, which sets out his reasons for making his decision. And therefore, you will see that the judges aren't capricious, arbitrary, willingly put the society at risk. It's a considered decision that they must make. Bearing in mind the jurisprudence that Sir Brian has articulated, a person should not be denied bail simply as a punishment for a crime for which he has not been convicted. Let's let's, let's go to the core of our system. Now. Do you put evidence before the judge to circumstances why? For the protection of society, for the protection of the person, that this person ought to be denied bail. But you have to put the material before the judge to enable the judge to make that evaluation. And I, I, I think it's fair to say that there has been significant improvement in the quality of the material that is put before the courts on applications for bail. And judges are aware of what goes on in society. We not mean to say we don't live in ivory town. Nobody. Nobody wants to put the society at risk. Why are you letting these people out on bail? Well, we do not move on the premise that if he were not guilty, the police would not have brought him here. You know, that, that's, that's, I know, I know, I know, I know a lot of, I know, I know a lot of persons in the public form that view or believe that, you know, the police brought him here. He, if he ain't guilty of this, he's guilty of something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, and therefore, and therefore, lock him up. But that's, as Ryan says, that's not the way our, our society or our system of law operates. Mr. Burton? The only comment I would make is that despite the painstaking explanations given such as my three colleagues have, have um, repeated here in formal and informal speeches. I'm continually amazed at statements 
being uttered by people who clearly ought to know better about murderers being granted bail. I mean, so, you know, there, there's a, I, I could, um, um, f fortunately, I am out of the system in terms of the Bahamas, but, um, and uh, um, some of you might embarrass me by saying I work in another system where persons have been held in custody for many, many years, only to be acquitted later, but we wouldn't go there. So that the, um, the, the, but in the context of the Bahamas, the, the, I, I don't know what it's going to take to get over to those who, uh, not only in the press, um, but elsewhere, who <clears throat> refuse uh, or unwilling or unable to draw the distinction between someone who is charged and someone who is convicted. Something that seems to be, for us judges, so elementary a, a, a distinction. Again, I'm going to take the role of Joe Public here. Um, I think I know when, when I started in this business many years ago, uh, the landscape was different even for reporting. But what we have seen, and I think this is a part of the, even the public's anxiety, uh, individuals who are out on bail, who are, who are with an ankle monitor, um, who may be out uh, on, on, you would have said, two, three uh, different charges on bail uh, involved in another offense. I think to the public's anxiety, it seems to be a change. Because I do not remember when I started in this business as a young journalist, having to report on these kinds of things. So I think it goes back to something we started out with. Uh, the society has changed. The, the profile of the criminal has changed. Has the law or is the law keeping pace? Because I, I, I'm asking again from the public's perspective, because when I started in the business, we didn't cover these kinds of stories. But when the police tell you he's known to us or the body has an ankle bracelet or this, is, this person has been involved in multiple or suspected of being involved in multiple crimes. For me, that is a change in the landscape. But Mr. Sawyer, it, it, it's incumbent upon the Crown to bring evidence before the judge to support a submission that the accused should be denied bail. Now, if, if I may say, I, I think that this subject was excellent, excellently covered by both the current Chief Justice and the Attorney General in their respective speeches at the opening of the legal year. Uh, and, and if you're truly interested in, in a balanced view, I would commend both of those speeches to, to you. But you know, you have competing interests. You have the protection of the public, which is a critical issue. And then you have the fundamental rights of an accused person and the presumption of innocence. I don't think any judge is saying that there are not cases where bail should be denied. Of course there are cases, but it is incumbent upon the Crown to bring the facts which would justify that. It's not simply a matter of saying, this person has been charged with murder. Full stop. As if that's a basis to deny bail, right? That, that isn't going to win in any, any court. But, um, and I think the Attorney General adverted to the Crown being more aggressive in, in, in opposing bail. And I believe in the amendment to the Bail Act that now the Crown can appeal a denial of bail um, as well as the accused person. You know, so, so I think those are useful developments. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you, you've got to come with more than the police has arrested you. And if you have the evidence, and the criteria is clearly set out in the Bail Act as to what the factors are that the judge has to consider. And if you have the evidence and you put it in, the, in, an, in an affidavit before the court, um, the judge will give that due consideration. But you, you've got to go more than lock him up because he's charged. Yes, we'll move forward. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to, um, while we are on the issue of judicial process, speak to the effectiveness of jury trials, uh, referencing here uh, something from 
to Burton Hall um, in 2012. And he says, the question for the Bahamas is how soon, if not, will it unshackle itself from the anachronism of trials by jury, a practice which serves little purpose other than to delay and in some cases frustrate the due administration of justice. What, what, sorry, what? I'm sorry, what, what's, what's the question? Uh, <laughs> if I might, uh, are we, do you still hold that view? More so, more <laughs> firmly than ever. The, um, the um, uh, remarks from which that is taken, um, I was reminded when the principal circulated the material um, um, for us, uh, at the details into which I had gone at that point, and um, any of you who are interested can follow it up. But among the reasons that I think, uh, I, I mean, apart from the cost and inefficiency and whatnot, to my mind, the fundamental flaw, and forget of the, let's put aside all the romantic notions and persons can dread it, um, 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 statements by uh, English judges and American judges going back over the centuries about the right to trial by jury. Forget the romantic nonsense for, for the moment. <laughs> but something seems to be fundamentally wrong with the notion that persons who are charged with the most serious offenses, that the decision-making body give no reasons for their decision. One of the problems that the um, courts of appeal, and I'm sat in the court of appeal, uh, 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 the court of appeal here, is you have to divine the um, reasons for uh, conviction, and bear in mind there is no appeal against an acquittal by a jury um, from what the judge would have said. And the one thing, as I said, you really. Um, um, it's a divining exercise, for want of a better expression. And to underline the absurdity, in my mind, of this decision, is that in the Bahamas, we have, we call them electable offenses, but under the third schedule to the um, Criminal Procedure Code, there are certain offenses, which, indictable offenses, which a person um, might elect to be tried before a stipendian circuit magistrate, um, as a thing from a lay magistrate. So there are two levels of inconsistency there, but let's forget about cases arising for lay magistrates where they still function. But if a person is charged with housebreaking, which is one of the offenses, and elects to be tried by a magistrate, that magistrate is required to give reasons for either convicting or acquitting. If that person elects trial in the Supreme Court and is tried by a jury, the, the, the fact, the, the fact-finding body of the jury gives no reasons at all, is required to give no reasons at all. So how is not only an appellate body, but how is the public at large ever able to uh, discern or grasp how it is and why this decision was made? So that the, um, the, I was, bef before I, um, left the Bahamas to work elsewhere, I took for granted that jury trials were given. And then when I went to my other work, I realized, no, in fact, those countries which do it are a minority of countries. And there are uh, uh, any number of reasons why the, uh, um, the, the, the one of the, um, uh, cliches that come out of the American experiences, uh, I'd rather be um, tried by 12 than carried by six. <laughs> and they talk about jury nullification. So you have this whole notion that the jury is entitled, regardless of what the law is, even if the judge gives the correct direction on the law, they can still say, well, the, the state can do whatever it wants to do. We're going to let the person go. And that strikes me as being fundamentally wrong. And as we evolve in this society, the flaws, to my mind, in that system are, are more and more apparent. You know, 
I, I, I must admit that I was ambivalent on this issue. Firstly, the right to trial by jury is not a universal right. It's not part of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And as the Virgin says, trial by jury is probably in the minority in terms of countries. Secondly, the vast majority, the vast majority of offenses that are tried in the courts are not tried by jury. The charge, they're tried by a magistrate. Most couple of cases are heard in the magistrate's court, more so than in the Supreme Court. And as the Britain says, a magistrate has to give a reason for why he has convicted or acquitted a person. So you have some sort of an idea and understanding as to why he did it. And trial by jury is not fail safe. Before I demitted office as Chief Justice, Sir Hartman insisted that I must preside over a criminal trial. He said I could not end my career with no trial over a criminal trial. And the offense for which the person was charged was a awful carnal knowledge of a 12-year-old girl. Girl gave evidence. Her uncle, who was present, gave evidence. And needless to say, you know, giving evidence is not an easy thing. Being in the witness box and being cross examined. And when the evidence was completed, I had to do my summation. And as I did my summation, I was trying to figure out how long I was going to send this place into prison. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was no question in my mind. I heard the evidence that this fellow was going to be convicted. And my only question was, how long should he go to prison? When that jury came back <laughs> with an acquittal, it was dumbfounded. And I have no idea how and why they came to that conclusion. So there's really no magic in trial by jury. The more, the majority of cases in the Bahamas are not tried by jury. And there are a lot of cases in the world where trials are not made by jury. In fact, there are cases where a jury trial is probably not a good idea. I'll give you an example. Suppose you have a complex fraud case. A jury of seven persons of humble origins may not be able to fully grasp the complications of a fraud case involving commercial fraud, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure that that's the best way of adjudicating that kind of a dispute. So, we mustn't be tied to the 
the bad news is the phrase, the romanticism of trial by jury. We do need to take a cold clinical view as to whether or not there are ways in which we can, in fact, reform the criminal justice system and reduce, if not eliminate, the number of trials by juries and the risk involved with that. Thank you. That, that is just a personal view. I'll just make this quick observation. You know, there are some countries, and I believe Trinidad may be one of those countries, which actually gives the accused person the right to elect whether they want a trial by jury or a trial by judge alone. I think, I think that's in Trinidad. I was speaking to the Chief Justice of Trinidad some years ago. And what, what he said, Chief Justice Archie, and what, what he said was that they were a little surprised um, at how many times the accused person actually chose a trial by judge alone. Now, I don't, it was nowhere near as many times as, of course, they chose the jury. But, you know, as a halfway measure, um, to, to test the point, that, that might be an option to look at, um, as opposed to uh, taking this step you know, in, in, in one big move, uh, give the accused person an opportunity to elect um, and, and see how that works. I mean, I, I think it works quite well in Trinidad, from what I was told, but, <laughs> but maybe not. Okay, so Justice of Appeal Smith would know. But nevertheless, I think it's one way of, of dipping your toe in the water as opposed to doing the whole thing in one, in one move. Yeah. I'll, only, sorry, I'll only add, I, I certainly agree with everything uh, the good gentleman here said. Uh, the bulk of the trials in our courts are done by magistrates without a, without a, without a jury, and decisions are appealed, and they're decided by the way. The one thing that would happen if we get rid of juries is trial process will be so far advanced in terms of how quick the trials will take place. We abandon what is because there's no need to, to examine whether a jury, whether a confession is, is, is bad or not because the same judge hearing the case. All these issues with juries popping out, juries popping in. Uh, we have difficulties in getting people to serve as jurors. That, that's a point. You know, uh, <laughs> It is a, it's like pulling teeth to get, you know, we get letters after letters of people trying to beg off of, of jury duty. It's difficult to get persons to, to serve, serve, serve as jurors. Uh, so that is certainly one positive in terms of delays. We certainly would advance the process of fee. So I guess my next question is what would be the impediment to moving towards that? Constitutional, Constitutional. to begin with. Uh, this, this, you left them in the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it, it, to, to Ian no, is that, the point that I was going to make again, that I'm not sure the Bahamian people are serious about trial by jury. Yeah. Because one of them tried to get out of it. Yeah. You know, it it's, amazing, <laughs> it's amazing when I, I was Chief Justice. Well, I guess part of the reason I'm asking is that uh, we have not had a good track record when we attempt to change things in the Constitution. <laughs> um, Which is one of the reasons why I suggested at the last two openings that perhaps we try the halfway house, or at least give the option to the to the accused to select a jury trial, uh, and at least in those cases, at least we we have a, a smooth process. So as we although, move, although I might add, I've heard mm -hmm. some of my judges in the criminal division who are happy to have the jury make the decision rather than <laughs> the, 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 I will call no names. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. We're going to uh, advance our discussion a bit uh, to speak to technology in the courts, uh, something that has uh, really come front and center in the past few years. Um, the digitalization of court systems and access to justice. I'm going to quote uh, former Chief Justice Maury when he gave um, his charge in January of 2022. It is my view that remote video hearings in the Supreme Court are here to stay and are now a permanent part of the court system and will be used as one of the 
deposition modes in addition to in-person hearings, telephone hearings, and applications on papers. As this was uh, a part of your charge, so I'll begin with you. Um, again, uh, I know that during your tenure, this was one of the things that uh, you worked judiciously to try and, and bring forward and try to advance. Um, and particularly uh, when we talk about the backlog, and uh, a lot of the issues that are, are, are facing our court system, again, many times drawing the criticism of the public. Um, but have we moved the needle enough? Well, I think it's a process, and I think a remarkable um, developments have occurred uh, in the last sort of four or five years. I must say, you know, COVID was obviously a terrible thing for the country, but th there was this benefit from COVID. Um, we had to innovate, and I'm not just talking about the court system, but every industry in the country and indeed government itself. Um, and so the introduction of technology into the court system, I think, was probably easier during COVID than it would have otherwise have been because the natural resistance to change that we would have confronted was largely dissipated because change was no longer an option. It was a matter of survival. Um, I mean, we simply could not conduct court proceedings and the entire court system could not work in the way in which it had before. So I think that created a much more receptive mood for change. And I, I, I commend the bar um, who responded very well to the changes that we had to introduce. So, you know, technology is an integral part of the delivery of justice. There's no question about that. In 2024, um, you, you have to leverage the benefits that you get from technology. Um, there have been many, many innovations, um, and the current Chief Justice um, can speak to this in, in his tenure. Uh, if you look at, at the way in which the court business is being done today, it is fundamentally different to what was happening certainly six or seven years ago. Um, there is now, I think, uh, a reasonably good technology platform in the courts, uh, laptops, um, iPads, mobile devices are an integral part of all courtrooms today. Um, electronic filing, which the Chief Justice has just introduced, um, is transformative. It'll fundamentally change the way that the registries work. Um, the digital recording system, which is being introduced, and I think is now in all of the magistrates' courts, transformative. You know, up until what, um, CJ, maybe a couple of years ago, or maybe even more recently than that, magistrates were keeping a manual note of the proceedings in their court. I mean, the only thing that magistrate didn't have was a quill. That was last year. <laughs> you know? Um, th th this, this was uh, unbelievable. Now, um, I think I'm right in saying that there is now a digital recording system in every magistrate's court. This is so liberating to the magistrate both in terms of output, productivity, the quality of the job, because you, you know that, first of all, it was impossible to take a verbatim transcript of the proceedings, no matter how attentive the magistrate was. Secondly, the magistrate was in cases reduced to being a scribe, um, as opposed to being a judicial officer. Um, that has fundamentally changed. The digital recording system is being rolled out. Um, you know, there, there has been I, I personally believe, although this is up to the Chief Justice and future Chief Justices, I don't think we'll ever go back to a system where there's, there's all in-person hearings. I think we're in a hybrid now and we'll continue to be in a hybrid. Um, they've proven to be remote hearings, have proven to be very efficient. Uh, I think, generally speaking, although the President um, may have a different view on this, but I think the bar has embraced remote hearings. and and largely they support them. Um, so th there's no question with, with all that is going on, with the technology platform, with the digital recording system, with the bail management system, um, you know, with uh, the remote hearings, um, there has been tremendous progress. Um, and I, I think that that, that will continue. 
uh, under the current Chief Justice. Can, can I publicly congratulate both Sir Brian and Sir Ian for the remarkable work that they have done in bringing the court system into a modern era. Both of them have, were committed to doing it, and they have seen it through. There is no going back. We have to embrace technology. In the Court of Appeal, we have not had an in-person hearing since COVID. All of our hearings are done remotely. I see in the audience my friend, Mr. Frederick Smith <laughs> from Grand Bahama. I haven't seen him in years. <laughs> Mr. Smith told me that he was ambivalent about this remote hearing because he thought something would be lost in his not being able to provide eloquent advocacy in person before the court. I think he would be most upset if we went back <laughs> <laughs> to requiring him to travel to Nassau. from Freeport to Nassau <laughs> to do a case. You know, and simple things like, and Fred, I hope you don't mind me using this example. You know, Fred had an accident and therefore had to be able to not stay still for too long a time. He could not be in person before us getting up and now moving to make sure he's flexible. He could easily do that in his office on the platform. Lawyers do not have to travel hours before coming to court. They need to, or they need to be court ready in 15 minutes. They don't have to be lugging books and papers all over the place. Most of the documents are now digital. Following up on what Sir Brian and Cian have done, we are now going to introduce electronic filings in the Court of Appeal. All of this makes access to justice efficient, less costly, and there is no going back. Thank you, sir. Um, so Ian, would you like to chime in before we, we move forward? In terms of digitization, I, uh, this isn't just this process didn't just start with uh, Sir Brian and myself. I know as far back as when Sir Burton was Chief Justice, there were efforts made either through Gems or I think there was a uh, benchmark was the name of the the entity who got a contract to do the digitization of court records, which followed through I think with Sir Michael at one point. But continuous Chief Justice have, have been seeking to, to get our records digitized, to be able to uh, elevate the basis on which uh, lawyers are able to do their work and the court is able to uh, work more efficiently. The electronic filing platform, which I know some of my, my, uh, my lawyers in the crowd are still uh, on the fence about, and we're in this growing pains uh, phase and we'll get you through it. Or you'll get us through it as it, as it were. Uh, but it offers the ability for the lawyers to view their files from the comforts of their, their offices, to file their documents without having to walk into, into court, and to be able to uh, save time and be more efficient in the work they do for their clients. The digital recording helps us in a serious way in the sense that uh, sonographers are a, a scarce resource. Uh, we now have digital court reporting in each of the magistrates' court. We finally, at the end of last year, got them in the last of the civil courts. We still have some issues with one or two of the courts, but generally, in most of the courts, there's the digital recording system. 
to allow us to function more efficiently, to not be able to have the legacy issues with waiting to get transcripts. Because with the digital, digital call reporting, we are able to have a, uh, a rough draft of the transcript within hours of the completion of the, the, the hearing. You can get a, a speech-to-text conversion, uh, which goes a long way to be able to uh, properly get our cases through, through the system. Gentlemen, uh, as we are rounding up our discussion, as I, I told you um, before we came in. Mr. So, Soy, may I just make one other very short point? <clears throat> if anybody in this room has ever tried to do a cause list search in the registry, there, there could be no better testimony for digitization. I mean, we, we have these, these very old books um, that you have to search through. Many of them, pages are missing. Um, so I just give that as an example. All, all of that, I think, will, will be, when this is finished, that'll be a thing of the past. Gentlemen, uh, we are just about done with our discussion, and so we're going to round up. As I told you at the beginning, um, we could not even uh, begin to flesh out all of the issues uh, that we would like to within this time, but I think that we have done a, a pretty decent job up to now. And so as we round off the discussion this evening, I want to end really with a look at challenges in the future. And I'm going to invite each of you to chime in as, as we close off. But what do you see are the biggest challenges for the judiciary in keeping the law relevant in the face of rapid technological, social, and environmental advancements? So, Burton, maybe I saw it. Uh, I, I don't know that there's an easy answer to that, um, but the, um, as in the past, and it will always be in the future, is managing expectations, because the society is structured in such a way that the courts uh, are the, is or are, the, the, the body to which persons um, look um, for a variety of reasons and um, with all of the challenges that face society, our society and societies generally, um, the, 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 the courts will, will always be in this um, difficult situation of um, meeting but yet managing, and I repeat the word managing, the expectations the society have and, and to, to recognize the limitations of what courts can do. No matter what systems we may put in place, the key and the major challenge is to ensure that we have the best persons discharging the duties of our office, making sure that they have the skills and the training to do their job. And so our struggle or our challenge is to continue to find persons willing to take that judicial oath and able to discharge it properly. So, Brian, and then, sir, you'll. Well, I, I think one of the biggest short to medium term challenges it is the assimilation uh, of all the innovations and in technology that the court system is in the process of introducing. This, this, is, this is not tweaking the edges. These are institutional transformative changes in the way in which justice is delivered in the Bahamas. Um, th these are serious big issues. And you don't, you don't go through this type of change, this quantum change that we're going through easily. It's a bumpy road. Um, so Michael is right. As you introduce more technology, you do have to enhance the skill sets of your staff. 
Um, to technology brings a lot of benefits, but ultimately, it's only a means to an end. It's not the end itself. So you have to be able to have the resources, the staffing, in order to leverage the technology. You have to assimilate the changes. You have to change your practices. Um, and we, as a, as, a, as a leading international financial center, have many challenges in terms of artificial intelligence, what, what now is generative AI, it's called. We, the, whole, the whole process of commercial transactions is being changed. You know, there, there, there are smart contracts that, that are produced on blockchain. Uh, I mean, th the language is different. The, the judge of 20 years ago wouldn't even understand the, the, the language that is now being used. Um, so I think the challenge really is, is, is to assimilate it, perfect it, build out the infrastructure, provide the resources, um, and I think, frankly, that is a three to five year process. Um, I think at the end of five years, um, there will be other challenges that have to be addressed, but that I think is, is really the focus. And to stay up to date with, with all that is going on around us. Um, but I think I, I'm personally very optimistic. I think these are exciting times for the administration of justice. And I think a lot is going on. Um, there's still complaints that can be made, um, but, but generally speaking, uh, we've come a long way. All right. See, and I give you the, the closing. The thing about going last, of course, is that the, everyone says some of the things that you, you thought you would say. <laughs> uh, but uh, certainly resource, human resource, is, is, a, is, a, is a major issue. As we advance in technology, there are new things we have to take into account. Cybersecurity, uh, computer literacy of, of staff, judicial and uh, ordinary staff, uh, security generally, uh, in terms of uh, the crime level in the country is is all across the board. In terms of the threats, whether real or perceived, and the need to uh, ensure that uh, staff, court users, the public feel safe when they come to, 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 to courts to give, to give evidence. But generally, uh, I think we're uh, getting in a better place. And I, I think, uh, by and large, we have the support of all the stakeholders. All right. Gentlemen, thank you very much, audience. Please, a round of applause. <laughs> it is rare. Uh, that we are in a place and sit among all of these gentlemen at the same time and are imparted with, with their wisdom. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for being a part of this as well. And my congratulations and thank you, Madam President and organizers from the Eugene DePeach Law School. I think this is a great testament to your 25th anniversary um, and what you have been able to do in the country. And we thank you so much and thank you for your guidance. I always I have to say that I'm not the smart one. I just have smart people behind me. So thank you very much for the honor of being here tonight. Uh, I do hope that you have enjoyed this, gentlemen. Thank you for the work that you do for this country. The Bahamas is a better place for your service. And so I thank you very much. And with that, we end this evening's discussion. Thank you.